Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're being joined by Mark Testoni, uh, who is the CEO of SAP National Security Services. I think that's also referred to as NS2. Is that correct, Mark? Correct, Mark. Yeah, it's, National Security Services is a large mouthful for guys like me to say, so we had to come up with an abbreviation. I, I'm all about abbreviations. That's good. And I hope I pronounced your last name correct. Please, you did. Please. You got it okay. correct. Thank okay. you. 50 50 there. So. <laughs> there we go. So, where are you at now, Mark? I'm down in the West Palm Beach area, actually. I kind of commute back and forth between here and Northern Virginia time to time. So, that's yourself? nice. Yeah. Um, I'm in Seattle, and, and we've had like four days in a row of sunny weather, which if you're familiar with the area is yes. very unusual, and we've got like another week of no clouds in the sky. Um, That's usually itself. like July and August out there. Isn't it? For like a week, right? <laughs> For like a week. Yeah, yeah, beautiful part of the country, as is this right now. It's very nice. Exactly. Time. Well, I mean, if the, you know, the, you're, everybody's looking for silver linings for this pandemic, and one of the things is it's freed up a lot of people to work from various locations. I, I just interviewed uh, somebody last week who runs a Silicon Valley startup, uh, but took his family down to, uh, to to Palm Springs. He says, I can't, you know, I can't deal with the kids at home. We go down here, they've got the pool, and um, and we can do that because of the kind of fluidity of where we're at with uh, this. Yeah, it's an interesting point, not to distract from what you want to talk about, but I think, you know, this people talk about getting back to normal. I think we're kind of in the newer normal now. It's going to evolve a little bit back more towards but I think somewhere between what we were doing 18 months ago and what we're doing now is where the new normal will be. I t totally agree with you. And, th and then you look at places like, you know, the U.S. has been kind of on this flex work, work from home, remote work, uh, you know, trajectory for a while. Um, I spent a lot of time in Japan, for example, and, they, you know, corporate Japan has been just, you know, steadfastly against yep. anything, you know, no way, it's impossible. You got to be in the office exactly at nine, stay as late as possible. Everybody takes lunch exact same time. Well, everything's gone upside down right now, and now they're encouraging, and they're seeing the benefits from it in, in yep. terms of you know re reduced commute times, um, you know high, improved employee morale, uh, but also you have overhead costs. And if you start factoring in the fact that you know most offices sit empty 16 hours a day or whatever it is, you know, so um, I think you're right. Yeah, I think what's interesting too is I think we tend to forget that even a short commute is actually will eat up an hour a day plus. Oh, yeah. And people have recaptured that time. So I think they don't want to give it up unwillingly. I think they do recognize the importance of being together at times, but they don't think they need to do it all the time. So except the Japanese culture is kind of like, to some degree, the investment banking culture here, because they're still talking about driving or dragging everybody back in 18 hours a day. So that's we'll there, that is, there, there is that there is that. Well, hey, Mark, uh, why don't you uh, start off and, and tell us a little bit about the work that you do at SAP National Security Services, or NS2. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, first of all, having me on your program, your podcast. You know, we, I think many of your listeners have probably heard of SAP Global Software Company, maybe the third largest software company in the world, focused <laughs> largely historically on what we would call the back office operations, or ERP. Basically, we do finance, logistics, human capital, all those things are really important that are common to very a lot of businesses. But of course, that business has pivoted, uh, like everybody, into more of an information business now. So what we do is we, because of SAP was grew up in Germany, and it's a foreign, foreign flag company, they had to create a, a separate company effectively to do this work in partnership with the U.S. government for national security in the U.S., and that's how we started out many years ago. But what's happened because of the way the cyber world has evolved and, the, and what national security used to be kind of like, oh, we're talking about defense and maybe State Department and things. It's now really all of us. Right. So we found our business footprint between that and the demand, the insatiable demand that we all have for information to be very important. So at our core, we basically are a value added deliverer and seller of SAP capability. But we're doing much more than that now. In a, much and the idea of security has become hugely important to what we take to market, not only for SAP products, but even some other company products that we're now taking to market. Okay, so in, in the context of, of what SAP is doing, I mean, you're, you're obviously not going to go in and talk primarily about logistics, you're talking about security, but is it talking about uh, 
securing SAP products and platform, or is it is it is it a completely different um, service? Some of both, actually. So we we put, and as we all know, everything kind of is rendered in the cloud now. I mean, we still sure. have customers who work on premise, but. If you're operating SAP and you have a security requirement that's maybe greater than the average normal company. So let's talk about companies in the regulated industry spaces like aerospace and defense or financial sure. services. You would probably come to us or many of them come to us to do support their systems, whether it's product support and kind of a traditional on-prem environment or doing implementation services. Or in the cloud, if we're rendering you a cloud capability, you would come to us because we've taken the SAP platforms and with our own IP and wrapped them in a, a security layer that meets all these important DOD and federal standards. And a lot of companies feel more comfort in that. We also deliver it with all U.S. citizens. So it's all done on the U.S. Now I'm starting to understand, get a little more clear. So, yeah. so that's part of the business, but we're also interestingly enough, starting to build some of our own products and we'll bring on third party products onto those same clouds that we've built because we've created some good IP that we think other products can benefit from because the barriers to entry in these higher level sure. security things are often high. I hope that makes sense. Definitely, definitely. And are you, does that also include managed services? We do, we manage, we'll manage, as in any cloud application, you manage the entire stack for the customer, right? I mean, ultimately yeah. they have the users, but we manage, the applications and we work with partners like AWS and Google and Azure to manage the infrastructure and we have other partner players as well. We don't build our own infrastructure. We use the commercial key players, sure. but then we put and manage, we manage them and the application on top of that stack. Excellent. Well, um, why don't you talk a little bit about the, you know, the state of national, the national security in the context of cyber in the U S where are we at? Are we safe? You know, Mark, we're safe. <laughs> Here's the way I try to, there's, there's a couple of perspectives. First of all, I think the threat is greater than it's ever been. And I think that's a siren warning that we have to be careful of because state actors are more active now. We've, we've heard many things in the press, the celebrated issues around the, you know, the, the accusations against China and Russia. But the reality is, is we've had 30 odd years of this great internet now, and it's created unbelievable wealth and prosperity for a lot of people around the world. We know that. And there's always been this underbelly of, of cyber threats. We all remember the emails we used to get from, from the, the people trying to give, get us to hand them money so we could get bigger money later, all that stuff. I that still get very, those emails. I don't know. <laughs> we still get them, I yeah. believe. And you know what? If we're still sending them, somebody is still responding to them. Must That's be. the scary part. Right. So, but so the threat is much greater now. And, and, and we're getting, but the capabilities are much greater. And so... We are, at a, in my state, uh, estimation, an inflection point. We've largely not done a good job in this country of two things. One, educating the public about its responsibilities. So I, I remember as a kid, for example, growing up, we had a tremendous pollution problem in this country. I'm, I'm old enough to remember that. I don't know if I'm... Oh, I, I remember the I remember the the the, the, the Indian uh, walking down and Native yeah, American and cry, yeah here, Native right? Americans excuse me and so, uh, and, 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 and 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 it was like this this idea that people would drive down the freeway and just throw their trash out the window. I mean, how bizarre is that? Of course, we used to have people that would smoke on airplanes too, right? That's <laughs> correct. You're so and you're getting at my point here because you and I remember the Native American. Absolutely. Here, that is in bold, and that was a public service announcement. It was based upon a series of them that got it: litter, air pollution, and water pollution. And what happened in this country in the '70s, largely, is we cleaned a lot of that mess up, right? Yep. We need the same kind of education for our public here, because the average person really still does not understand how important they, as an individual, are to our national security, and their own personal security and the security of their company, their companies that they work in or organizations that they work for. So I think that's one thing that we need to do a lot better of. The second thing is there, there needs to be more collaboration. The government and the private sector largely continue to operate independently around the cyber threat. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, national security is much broader now. The stakeholders, think about all the stakeholders that each company are tied to. Whether you're the government, the Department of Defense, and, and the number of the providers, and like it's this is real. So we all need to be in this together. And I, 
we've had a lot of ceremonial kind of activity over the years between, say, head leadership in the Department of Defense and Silicon Valley or leadership of government. We actually need to get together and collaborate around policies, everything from the privacy policy to how we will work as a team to not allow these state actors and others to exploit the crevices between. Uh, so there's a whole lot that I could talk about there, but the reality is, is we need collaboration, we need education to start with. We have the greatest technical minds in the world here. We are still the innovative capital of the world. We can innovate our way through this. We have to culturally get along with it at the same speed. Well, I mean, you, you bring up some really interesting points, and I, yeah, firm believer in education in many different areas, and, and that, you know, we need more of it, especially uh, when it comes to data protection, cybersecurity. At the same time, I mean, you know, the data protection standards in the U.S. are relatively lax if you compare them to, say, for example, GDPR or even the Chinese version of GDPR, whether or not they fully enforcing it to the letter of the law. But you know what I'm saying? In principle, it's there. Here we have a very fragmented patchwork of different states and different industries all kind of putting together what they think is the, the most appropriate. What are your thoughts in alignment with, you know, educating the public, but also um from the, the the corporate side or from the, the the government, creating more of a national standard. Uh, we need to get there, and like many times, but you know it's funny, Mark. In this country, and I call it sometimes I call it the King George syndrome. Okay. Although we have a strong federal government to do certain things, we we as as individuals still distrust central authorities, because it goes back to the birth of the country, right? So there's right. always been this less national approach than maybe you know other parts of the world have had. And that's benefited us at times, and at times like COVID, it, it's been a challenge for us, right? right? Because we don't, it's hard for a, I don't care who the president is, to mandate on states to do things that are inside their progress. So similarly here, I think it's what we have is today, like on a privacy, for example, the, 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 the next privacy thing we're gonna have is the next cyber thing. We'll have a bunch of congressional hearings. They're kind of largely theater. And then nothing really happens. And what I think we need to do is bring the private sector leadership together with the government, the Congress and the administration and come up with baselines around what, where we should take policy in this country as it relates to this and communicate about it. The good news is, is that we tend not to overreact too quickly in this country like they often do in other parts of the world. And it doesn't hinder business. But I think we're getting to that crucible now where we have to deal with some of this stuff. You and I are already affected by GDPR, largely because companies have to meet those standards. Sure. Those notifications we get on the cookies. Yep. You know, on our, Sometimes they're almost annoying, but I know, it's, I know it's there for my, for my benefit. But. <laughs> it is. But, you know, and the privacy thing is really important because people, it's, Americans have always been private. They always felt, remember, we always thought the government was going to put chips in the back of our head. Well, now we willingly carry the chips around, and it's not the right. government's collecting right. data, it's right. the private sector that's <laughs> collecting the data. So we got to deal with this, and I think everybody knows that. But on the one hand, we don't want to overreach either. And, right. and I think that's why we need to have a national dialogue around this. And I kind of laugh because I've been discussing this in various forums for about, and Kristen will laugh, about five or six years <laughs> that we need to do this. And I think we will eventually get there, though. I think that you're beginning to see... Even companies like the leadership in Facebook and, and, and some of these bigger, like Google, they're talking about the need for some of this because they just want to know where the rules of the road are to some degree so they can operate better. Right, and in, in many areas, we're kind of in uncharted territory, right? I mean, it, the, the, social media and who, you know, somebody posts a picture, who owns who owns that picture? That's and how does it, you know, this right to be forgotten? Well, if I can, will Facebook take down all my content? I, we have to talk about it. We have to come up with a, with a, a well, plan. I say. think there's something too. we need to make it. And this goes back into the education aspect again. And it's some things that could be done that are fairly simple. We, we talk about the annoying cookie notices. But today, when you and I download an app and we want the app, we just click yes. Right? Yes. Because there's like <laughs> you don't you don't pages. read. You don't read the six pages of that. fine print legalese. <laughs> so you know, we just page through. And if it's some, it's most aggravating if you have to actually page through it before you get right. to the accept. Right. What I'd like to see is something like we do with food here, which is like in one screen, the top two or three things that you should be, you know, addressing certain areas. So every individual will know, for example, their location data is going to be tracked. Right. Or whatever, which is obviously a pretty hot topic right now. So, I mean, I think we could do some things on a policy level that would much like look what food 
labeling right. good for this country. It actually, although we still have a problem with obesity and other things, it really has helped educate people. And so I think we need to do the same kinds of things here. And it doesn't all have to be grand and large, big policies to, to do it. Baby steps. Um, back on the theme of the private sector working with the government, sometimes that can make the public a little bit nervous um, because, I mean, we've had abuses of that in the past. Um, and so how, how, how do, you, does, do we have strike a balance? Um, well, I and I think you, you, you probably know what I'm referring to. But. No, yeah, there's a couple of angles here. So, so I think at the broad policy level, that's going to be open and transparent, and it needs to be. Now, as, as companies that, so, and I think, I mean, these should be national dialogues. So not only do we have the private sector and public sector getting together, but we talk about this stuff in the open, much like we have done in the past when we've had, uh, for example, you go back to the post-Snowden discussion. Well, let's go back to the night, late 1970s, the church hearings, which led to the FISA court because of what were appear, potential abuses that were going on, right? And then we had a revisit of that post. So was the, the FISA court working properly? We've had open air discussions. It doesn't mean that everything has to be open air. We can talk these policies. When it comes to our national security and defense, it's important as, as, as a Western companies in a free world that the companies can support national security. It doesn't mean that they don't have ethical standards around that. And I think most of them do. And, and the government has, and the Department of Defense has ethical standards. So I think there's enough, there are enough checks and balances in place to deal with it, but we kind of have a dialogue. And I think what's happened in recent years is if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, the government inspired an awful lot of the R&D, right? Remember the space yeah. program? We all thought it was about going on the moon. A lot of it was about doing basic sure. research that led to products that you and I enjoy today, right? including, by the way, the Internet. That's pivoted a lot of that investments now in the private sector and a lot of it's Silicon Valley and Austin, Texas and Boston, Massachusetts. We got to get the, the just like the government worked closely with the private sector in the past, we got to get back to that again, even though it's a new generation and a new world with it. Excellent. Um, do you do you feel that the US is any more or less vulnerable compared to some of the other leading economies around the world? So from a cyber perspective, particularly, I think we're more vulnerable because we're open and we're big. OK, if you look at the next, the largest, the other large player, <laughs> not so open, it's very big, but it's not so open. Right. So yeah. when you're a player like a Russia or a China, you don't have to ask for a lot of public permission to do things. You don't have laws like, you know, we have titles, for example, in this country. Title 50 is governs national intelligence. Right. Largely, that means you can't operate in the United States, right? T Title 24, 25 is, talks about federal law enforcement. That's the FBI. I mean, so there, are, we, there and there's lots of rules, as, as we all know, around this. Sometimes they get violated, but pretty much they're, that doesn't happen over there. So we're open. We're also, we drive innovation, so we're a target for people stealing. So we're always going to be more at risk, which is why we've got to work better together to preclude it. There, I think there are things that we could do if we, shared information on threats better between government and private sector, for example. The term collective defense gets thrown around a lot. The General Keith Alexander runs a company by the name of Iron Man. They talk about this a lot. He's talked about this for years. He's the former director of uh, NSA a number of years ago. But this concept of collective defense is really important. And today, I can tell you, there are some cases of it. Being in, uh, in the national security space, we have a defense industrial base kind of where there are some threat information, uh, you know, that is shared, but it needs to be much broader. It needs to be much more participated with by the government, not just between, say, the private sector players and facilitated by the government. So I think there's much more we can do. Yeah, it's interesting because we're a Microsoft partner, and uh, you know, Microsoft has their cyber crime unit, and they cooperate very closely with the U.S. government. Um, and have had done some amazing things together. So I, 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 I there, there's definitely a track there record, record for that. There's definitely anecdotal. And there, look, there's yeah. been a lot of good work that's done, but I think it's got to be more broadly. And we need to understand the interdependencies of many companies. Microsoft's a big player. I mean, SAP works very closely with governments around the world on certain things when they need to at times related to threats against the software platforms and all. So these are, I mean, these are all good things. We've got to build upon it because ultimately, when you have control over your society, you can 
operate at will overseas is different than when you're in an open society. And we're in that. Obviously. Absolutely. It's funny. I'm sure, I'm sure you've been to China, but for people who haven't been there, it's like it's, sometimes the control is it's not so overtly obvious, but like you're in a, you know, a taxi in Beijing and, and you're trying to get Google, do a Google search. And it's just, it's kind of, it's just taken forever to get the information. So what do you do is you hop over to Baidu, right? You know, just little things like that, that they can, they can just put the brakes on so many things and then they can monitor. And uh, it's, it, it's amazing. They've, Those are I, things that we could, although much of what we, you know, we, I think we as individuals don't realize how much we, create data that goes into various things in this country, but the threat of the government collecting and managing it isn't here, which you have over there. And, and oh, yeah. they clearly, somebody like you wanders into China and they know exactly what you're doing, where you are and when you leave and probably left, gave you a few parting gifts on the way back. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, let me ask you. I mean, you know, you're CEO of a large organization, and and it, ultimately you've got to you know drive the the health and profitability of that organization. You're you're also need to keep um, abreast and aware of of the latest threat, um, you know, threats. What, what the, how do you balance that? And and you know, and how important is it? For example, I, I know that. Uh, uh, the NSA just discovered some new vulnerabilities related to Microsoft Exchange Server. And a lot of people in the space immediately start talking about these different threats and, you know, you know how they work and what you can do. Um, but that's kind of very tactical. How do you manage the being aware but also running a business? You can't. Cybersecurity is like. I will say this, the cyber discussion inside my company and many companies is now at the same level as the discussion of the financial health. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's that serious. Okay. I have a security line of business effectively that largely helps us manage a lot of that. And it's got board level attention. So look, we, I view the cyber as anything else. There is nobody in this world, including the NSA probably, or some of these other places that in, in over in, in, in other countries that can say with exact certainty that they're completely safe from the cyber mm -hmm. threat because nobody is. So what do we do? We all manage risk and, and I call it managing your risk aperture, trying to make that risk profile lower. So when we make business decisions, we look at it from a standpoint of not only is this an economically viable capability we're taking to market, but can we protect that within the infrastructure we have? And, and is it, it, does it make sense for us to do that? So we are governed and we look at the security aspects of virtually, not virtually everything that we do. It is always a factor in the discussion. Notwithstanding that, you can't just be so obsessed with it that you don't do anything, right? And right. so I, my, my security team laughs at me because I remind them, we do business friendly security here, <laughs> right? So it doesn't mean we do stupid things, but we do, we can't just say no, the answer department of no. So we find ways and, and actually it leads to some innovation. And I think, you know, it's exciting in, in some ways because, um, you know, it's, you, you've got to, it's just another parameter. We always thought about security, but we looked at security differently. So let's go 2000, let's 10,000 years ago. The caveman's walking around and, and he wants to protect his stuff, right? So he rolls a rock in front of his cave, right? Or cave woman. And then the, his security threat was a bigger cave person came by and rolled the rock out and stole his stuff. I mean, we've been dealing with this for years. So everything is a put and a take. There are some policies that we do, and you mentioned patching is a really important thing. We man mm -hmm. I manage and we manage that very tightly to make sure that we're staying abreast. We isolate things when they happen if we by chance have a server that might have been affected by something. We do all those blocking and tackling things. But strategy wise, we're looking for business. We're building new products, but we do them with an eye towards security. Well, when you you know work with your your customers, how much of the discussion is focused on the technology um, and that their business requirements? versus more the policy level? I mean, patch management typically is a, is a, is a policy uh, level dis, dis decision or discussion, uh, but, but maybe even higher would be like, what's our risk, not, excuse me, not risk management, I'm, um, uh, 
response plan? What's our, you know, mitigation and response plan? I mean, and, and do you do you have those kind of kind of conversations with them, or is it more fo focused on the technology? No, we we focus on it. first of all, if you're going to render a cloud service to a customer, okay, you have to have a, a you know a service level agreement that we work with them on that says that does a lot of what ifing, right? Right. We're going to maintain a, a certain profile. These are the things that we're going to do. Oh, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Customer, these are your responsibilities because remember when I opened my networks and things to customers to come in and hang bang on servers, all of a sudden, what are they? They're now another stakeholder. It's in that chain, right? So these are important things. And we develop service level agreements. And we have these discussions with customers all the time. And they come to us, perhaps maybe that rather than going to a, a typical commercial provider or even a commercial SAP instance, because they feel like there's a little bit more security wrap, which there is because we've got higher standards we've got to meet. Not that the ones in the commercial ones aren't good, but it's just another layer. So we talk about capability, which is center still in all discussions. Customers are looking for things to solve challenges with or to create opportunity with, right? That's If we don't solve the problem, it doesn't make any difference. But we always talk in terms of the security around it and what happens if something happens and how can we deal with it and how can we help make sure that your business continuity is there and we worry about our own business continuity. By the way, I want to say one thing on patching up. The policy of patching is easy. The execution <laughs> of it, as you are well aware, is very difficult. Hey, here's our policy. Yeah, here's, <laughs> I mean, and part of it is like yeah. we tend to forget that, okay, Microsoft or Adobe or whoever rolls a patch out, but it's incompatible with the other software that it's working with and you blow your whole company up. So it's it's there's more art to this than <laughs> science. Well, yeah, and, and, and it also, so much of cybersecurity does come down to the human element too, right? I mean, you can have the policy in place, but if somebody's not actually doing it, it doesn't well, get done. That's, that's a leadership issue, and that's a, that's a control issue. That's something that we look very, I mean, we, we deal with very closely. So, yes, we can't apply that patch because of X, Y, Z. All right, how do we isolate it? How do we then get to a place where we're going to apply that patch? And those are, I mean, we've, we've all run into it with, say, our iPhone or Android too, right, where we took a patch down at some corporate thing didn't work anymore right I mean, it happens all the time so but makes everybody so really happy <laughs> yeah yeah really <laughs> um hey so so let me ask you just uh i'm gonna get three more questions okay um what advice would you give to a CISO, especially in the, in the regulated one of the regulated spaces besides you know, hire be, you <laughs> be, be business friendly Okay. okay, keep a business friendly mindset because I'm certainly not a C, so I'm not even a technical guy. I, I doesn't have a K in it somewhere when you spell technology, I forget. Okay. <laughs> uh, but be business friendly. In other words, don't, don't you know, advise your CEO and put policies in place, but always remember that whether you're a government agency or a, or a commercial entity like mine or one that you work for, we all have customers we have to serve. So we have to balance these things. And depending on what it is that we're dealing with, the balance may shift one way or the other, but be business friendly. To me, you know, it's kind of like lawyers who always got the joke of the department of no. I've worked <laughs> with great attorneys who help me get places and manage risks versus telling me I can't do so many things. Right? Is it amazing? Yeah, no, I, I really identify with the, the, the lawyer side and, and they want to protect you, but you need to get the the deal done too, right? I mean, and so there's, there's that there's that balance there. We, we've all of us that have been around sales, and you know, we know yeah. we know this, right? Now, I'm an accountant by trade, which is interesting when you're in sales because as we all know what RevRec is, revenue recognition right. is. It was always good to be an accountant dealing with RevRec, <laughs> but I mean, it's the same thing. But even the good RevRec people will help you get to the desired state, and not just say no. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, second to last question. What advice would you give to individuals out there? Uh, let's just say it's parents in a household and they, they're they like, God, you know, there's so much things to think about. Where do we start? We got the kids, we got us, well, you know, what do we do? I mean, there's basic blocking and tackling around security. You know, enable your encryption on your home Wi-Fi, for God's sakes, at least that. I mean, there are tools for younger kids that you can put on certain things to control applications and usage. Do these things. I mean, it's kind of like, to some degree, Mark, this reminds me of when I was a kid and my mom and dad would tell me I had to be home at nine o'clock, right? 
I mean, these are just electronic rules like that. And we've got it. And, and, and there are surveillance capabilities that you certainly put in there. But we don't want to overreact on the one hand, but we do need to protect our children from the other hand and, and just do the basic security things. And a lot of those take you know, 90 percent of the problem off the table. But there are amazing. I don't remember what statistic, but there's still an amazing number of households that, for example, don't even turn on encryption on their own Wi-Fi in their house. I mean. Or these they have the riddles. default the default passwords. Uh, or use for... <laughs> the default passwords. I mean, it's like you can't make it up. But this is you and I kind of laugh about it. But the percentages well, are shot. It's kind of like yeah. the percentage of people that still click on, uh, you know, spear phishing emails, right? right? And pen tests. So, so yeah. yeah. Well, well, that that comes with that that education. But I'm so happy to hear you to to give the example of be home by nine o'clock because. Uh, we we have a rule here with devices, uh, similar rule. Uh, Turn them the, off at nine o'clock. Yeah, exactly. And and they 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 go in a in a in a basket and they go and that gets locked in our room under you know high security. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, Until they nobody. get old enough to figure out how to pick the locks, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> now, but, you know, that's a really good point. I mean, that's the kind of thing. Parenting is parenting, and it has, in some ways it's changed, but and yes, it's more complicated. Fortunately. I've graduated from that part of my life. I don't have the little younger ones around anymore. Uh, but those simple things are so important. And they are. I think a lot of them are the same as they were when we were growing up. Excellent. Um, you know, I did have another question, and I, I, I forgot what it was now. So, uh, but um, what, any any information that you'd like to share uh, about uh, SAP National Security Services or yourself or, you know, things to look forward, you know, where you guys are going to be active. I mean, it used to be you talk to somebody and say, hey, we'll see you at this event. We'll see you at that event. <laughs> so if, for people that are interested in what we do, we have a website, www.sapns2.com. And it talks a little bit about, you know, some, you know, how we not only work with the SAP ecosystem, but we're now evolving into other places. We're about to launch a new product called Cloud Mixer, which I would point people to. It's going to be kind of a comprehensive tool to manage cloud infrastructures from a financial and usage capability. What people tend to forget today, when you, if you're a company and you, you get into the business and you're using like an Amazon Web Services or a Google, it's you got to manage those environments from a cost and usage and compliance perspective. So we've kind of, there's some capabilities out there, but we've kind of built a unified capability around that. Be worth a chat some other time maybe about, but it, it actually we think it's going to have some legs, and it's saved. You know, we've used tools, a tool like this, that we've started to develop internally, and saved us a ton of money on, and make sure that we use our environments correctly. So is this like a like a, 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 a TCO kind of analysis tool, or just to, it does uh, it, it does TCO, but it shows it does it looks at the amount of instances that you have active, how you're using them, you can see ones you're not using, the services you're using, and then you can. It gives you kind of what ifs about how you could apply certain resources sure. to save money or how you should, should I buy a three-year contract for this or how would I apply my reserved instances versus my on-demand. People spend a ton of money because they don't manage their cloud instances well. And, and, and that, makes, that makes other companies more profitable and maybe but your company less profitable, your organization less effective. So... Uh, reach, take a look. There's, uh, we're, we're working on some interesting things in the supply chain visibility area, which is something that I, you know, is near and dear to my heart, but I won't get into right now. It's going to be critically important to us. All this discussion about crypto and, and how everything is going is, is really cool with the prices and all this, but the reality is the blockchain technology and its, pre its successors are going to be key to our visibility in the supply chain. So it's an area that we're focused on. More to come there. And Finally, I would just tell, I'd say to your listeners, as, a, as someone who's been around, I often get asked, you know, what's one piece of advice people would you give some people? And I'd say be curious. Right. I think it's something I'm sure you've learned and I've learned. Always ask that next question because it's led to good things for, for me and our company and, and for many people. Just be curious and, and be there. So. I think that's good life advice in general. That's that, that's the great. Hey, Mark. Um, Great t talking with you. Really, really have enjoyed this. Uh, would like to have you come back sometime and talk about Cloud Mixer and anything else that's uh, that you know you guys are doing. Uh, but to really enjoy this and thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much and enjoy that sun while you can out there in Seattle.
Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.